I, wanna, I wanted us to start off the year, like I said a minute ago, thinking carefully about our ways, the way we lived this past year and the way we ought to live this coming year. And so I thought, what better place to go than the well-known, often-preached book of Haggai? <laughs> I got a couple chuckles. That was good enough. I'll take it. Um, so if you would, go ahead and open up there. I'll give you a minute because it is obviously not that well-known of a book and uh, not that often do you find it preached through. And so um, as we get started in that, I want to give us a quick overview of the context. Where does Haggai take place? When is it taking place? What, what's happening in the biblical timeline? And so here's where it fits in. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember when we went through the book of Daniel, is king of Babylon, and, and he took some Israelites into captivity, into exile, and, and one of the times he went into Jerusalem in 586 B.C., he destroyed basically everything, the wall, the temple, the city, and you could find that in, in 2 Kings. But, um, so he, he does this, and he takes most of the people with him back to Babylon to captivity, and they're there for around 70 years. But he does not, uh, the, the kingdom of Babylon does not last as uh, most kingdoms don't. Eventually, someone bigger, meaner, tougher than you comes along. And so Cyrus, the king of Persia, comes along, and he defeats Babylon and issues a decree uh, for the exiled nations that are there that they're able to return home now. And this happens in about 538 B.C. Then Sheshbazar led about 43,000 to 50,000 Jewish refugees back to Judah to rebuild the temple. We find this in Ezra. Zerubbabel, the governor, and the high priest Joshua led the people to build an altar to worship God when they got there. New foundation was laid for the temple, so everything is looking good. Like They're, they're back in their land. They're, they're getting ready to, to rebuild. They, they build an altar. They want to worship the Lord in, in the land that He gave them again. And they're getting ready to build the temple again. They lay the foundation. But the effort stopped there. Samaritans to the north didn't like that this was happening. They didn't like it. They hired lawyers and eventually persuaded the Persian authorities to, to make them stop working on the temple. And they were successful. For about 16 years... All progress on the temple had stopped, and, and this likely, as you would imagine, led to great discouragement for the people, for God's people. They, they lost some hope. Their walls were still in ruin. Their city was in ruins. The temple wasn't finished. They were in the land, but everything that they had known or everything they'd heard about, about the land that God had given them, everything they'd heard about Jerusalem was not like it should be. It was not like their ancestors knew it. And to top it off, there's even a famine going on at this time. They're still under Persian control as well. And then in 530 BC, Cyrus dies. His son takes over. He marches through Judah again. He conquers most of Egypt. But on his return home, he dies. He's likely assassinated is what happens. And so the throne is vacant. And so someone needed to fill the throne of Persia. And so Darius steps in. A high army official takes command of the army, marches back to Babylon, took out the rebels, and became king in 522 B.C., which is when we find ourselves finally in the book of Haggai. In 520 B.C. is where we find ourselves, the second year of Darius' reign. And during the book of Haggai, and in the book, God leads Haggai, his prophet, to encourage these hopeless people, these discouraged people, and these selfish, at times, people to rebuild the temple. And what's even more amazing is that Darius approves of it. He funds it through the royal treasury, and they take up the the agreement that Cyrus originally decreed that they could do this, that they could rebuild the temple, they could start rebuilding. And so that's where we find ourselves on the cusp of that. So look with me 
at Haggai chapter 1. And before we read it, would you pray with me one more time? God, we, we do thank you for your word. We, we understand that it's necessary for us that if we seek to be complete and equipped for every good work that you've called us to do, we need your word because it is through your word that does that. So in this time, Lord, help me to preach your word clearly. Help me to preach it truthfully, convictionally, and help us to hear it and to act upon it. And Lord, we know and understand and trust that as your word goes out, it will return accomplishing the mission and goal that you have for it. So Lord, we thank you for that, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Haggai 1, verse 1, and we'll read through just a little bit at a time here. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So we'll stop there for a moment. The word of the Lord comes to the two leading men of the people, the governor and the high priest, the governor of Judah, who is Zerubbabel, and the high priest, Joshua. And this is what God has to say to them through Haggai. So look at verse 2. The Lord of armies says this, these people say, The time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. God tells, again, the two leading men of the people, he tells them, these are what your people, what my people are saying and thinking, that it's not time to rebuild the temple. The time hasn't come to rebuild the house of the Lord. In other words, God tells the governor of Judah, who was to lead the people in righteousness before their God, that they are not concerned with rebuilding the temple of their God at this time. God tells Joshua, the high priest, who was to lead the people in worship of the Lord, that they have no interest in building the house of worship at this time. Can you imagine what these two men are feeling as they hear this? Their people... The people of God have no interest in the things of God. Talk about a gut punch. You're supposed to be leading your people in righteousness and worship before your God, and your people want nothing to do with it. So if the people aren't interested in rebuilding the house of the Lord at this time, what are they interested in? What what are they concerned about? Luckily, God gives us the answer In his word to his people, those people that are thinking this. Haggai receives the word of the Lord again, and this time it's not just to reveal to these two men, it's to address all of the people. Look at verses 3 and 4. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. is, Is it time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? God hits the people with a stinging question that gets right to the heart of the issue as to why they don't think it's a good time to rebuild the temple, why they aren't concerned about it. He says, is it a time for you to live in your paneled houses while my house is lying over here in ruins? In other words, you're not concerned with my house because you're too concerned with your own house. You're too concerned about what you want, not what I want. The people, for nearly two decades, sought only to worry about themselves and their houses while they ignored God and His house. Yes, there was opposition at the beginning, but that was 16 years ago. They had plenty of time to try again, but they weren't concerned about it. They they were fine worrying about their own houses. And so God tells them, "Is, is it really time for you to worry about yourself and Leave my house in ruins? God's had enough. He's trying to get their attention. And he's tried to get their attention before this as well, as we'll see in a moment. But it's not worked. He hasn't been able to get their eyes off of themselves and back onto him. And so he sends Haggai in to make it a little more clear for them as to why they're going through hardship and even why they're in a famine right now. Look at verses 5 to 11. 
Now the Lord of armies says this, Think carefully about your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but have never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never have enough to be happy. You put on clothes, but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages in a bag with a hole in it. The Lord of armies says this, Think carefully about your ways. Go up into the hills, bring down lumber, and build the house, and I will be pleased with it, and be glorified, says the Lord. You expected much, but then it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. Why? This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. Because my house still lies in ruins, while each of you is busy with his own house. So on your account, the skies have withheld the dew and the land its crops. I have summoned a drought on the fields and the hills, on the grain, new wine, fresh oil, and whatever the ground yields on man and animal and on all your hands produce. God tells them, think carefully about your ways. Think about how you've been living and how well things are going for you. God says to them, you've planted a lot, you've done all the right things, but you've harvested little. Sure, you have some to eat, but it's never enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never enough to be happy. You put on clothes, but not enough to get warm. You earn your wages only to put it in a bag with a hole in it. Again, he tells them, think about their ways. And also tells them how their ways ought to start looking. This is what you've been doing. Try this. Go into the hills. Bring down lumber, not to panel your houses, but to build my house. If your ways look like that, I will be pleased and be glorified. And then again, he reveals to them why they're in the situation they're in. You've been expecting much and received little. You brought the harvest to your house, and I am the one that ruined it. And in case they haven't understood why yet, he tells them again, because my house lies in ruins while you're busy with your own houses. God's discipline has been on them because of this. He's withheld the dew. He's withheld the crops. He's brought a drought upon them. Grain, new wine, fresh oil, the yield of the ground are all scarce. The people and the animals have little. Everything they put their hands on has been affected because they've not shown honor to their God. They've not sought to worship their God. They've not sought to serve their God. They have not sought to love their God only themselves. Worrying about their own houses. Church, we ought to wonder what God has called them to do and what God has called us to do. We ought to think carefully about our ways as well. Not only individually, yes, individually, but but as a church, individually, have you thought about your ways, first off, in the area of salvation? Have you repented of your sins? Have you put your faith in Jesus, the Son of God? Have you confessed him as Lord? Have you believed that he died on the cross for your sins, that he rose from the dead on the third day by the power of God? Have you been baptized as an act of obedience and testimony of your union with Christ and his death and resurrection? If not, then here today, God telling you, think carefully about your ways, because this is the single most important thing you could ever do in this life if you wish to have life forevermore. If you wish to have life that is unending and everlasting, think about your ways and ask yourself, have I done this? Or have I just been too worried about myself? Have I thought about God's ways and what He wants, what He's called me to do, which is to repent and believe? Or have I just said, I'm okay doing my own thing? But for those of us who have done that, who have believed, who have put our faith and hope and trust in the Lord, 
We still need to think carefully about our ways as well. You need to care, think carefully about your ways. Have you been expecting much only for it to amount to little? If so, I want you to think, is it possible that the reason is because God is disciplining you for worrying about your own house while his house lies in ruins? Let me put it a different way. Do you think it's possible that you expected much and got little because you were too busy worrying about yourself and what you wanted to do instead of worrying about what God wanted you to do? Now, I'm not saying... Don't hear me saying that if you're going through a hard season, then that's God's discipline on you, because that might not be the case. We go through hard things in life because we live in a fallen and sinful world. But if you are going through a hard season, I think it's helpful and right to ask, is it because God is disciplining us? You need to think carefully about your ways, because it could be That God is trying to get your attention. Just like he was trying to get their attention. Have you been concerned about the things of God? Have you been in the word lately? Have you opened the word of the Lord that again gives us life and equips us to do the things God has called us to do? Have you been on your knees in prayer? Have you sought to come to our weekly prayer meeting? Because God has called us not only to pray individually, but together. And yes, we can do that here on a Sunday morning or a Saturday afternoon. But we could also do it on a Wednesday night, every Wednesday. Have you been making gathering with the people of God a priority, not an afterthought? Not just in this hour of worship, but in Sunday school, at Bible study, from house to house, week to week, meeting just for the sake of gathering together and opening the Word? Have you been serving in the church? And if so, are you using the gifts as well as you could be in that ministry? Or maybe there's another ministry that you're being called to do, that you're gifted in, that would benefit the church and would glorify the Lord. But if you're not in any, ask yourself why, and then ask, where can I serve? Have you been serving in your community? Have you gotten to know your neighbors? Are you just going out? Now today's a little different and tomorrow's a little different because I'm just thinking about getting in and getting out if I got to go to Walmart because it's freezing outside. But regularly, are you going out and are you looking around at the community and the people around you in order to say, hi, how can I love them? How can I serve them? How can I see an opportunity to share the gospel if I don't have my eyes open? Have you been giving of your money and your time as an act of worship and not just mere duty? Have you been participating in worship? Not just being here, but participating, singing. You know, there's, I'm not going to say that because I don't know that for sure, but I'm pretty sure that there are more commands in Scripture to sing than there are to pray. Are you singing when we gather to worship? I can't sing a lick, but I sing. Maybe you can't sing a lick. That's okay. We can do it together. We can sound bad to those around us together, but we'll sound sweet to the Lord. Are you participating in worship? Are you hearing and responding to the word of the Lord as you've been called to do? Not just saying that was a nice message when you leave here on Sunday, having no idea what actually was preached. Are you listening? Are you responding? Have you been discipling those around you? Have you sought to be discipled by those around you? Have you sought to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength? Have you sought to love your neighbor as yourself? Have you shared the gospel with the lost around you? I know it's scary. I know it's awkward. It doesn't matter. We were called to it. 
And God is glorified in it, even if you stumble over your words, because He is the one working in and through that. Not you, it's not up to you and your own knowledge and ability. It's up to the Spirit of God working through you and in their heart. Think carefully about your ways individually, but what about as a church? Have we been expecting much and it amounted to little? If so, again, it may be because we have not been as concerned about the things of the Lord as we should have been. It may be because we have been okay with the house of the Lord lying in ruins. Now don't hear me say house of the Lord and think the building. It's not what I'm talking about. The house of the Lord is not this building. What I mean is what Paul talks about in the book that we're going to go through next, in 1 Corinthians 3 and 6, that we are the house of the Lord. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Are we okay with us, the body of Christ, lying in ruins? Because we shouldn't be. We need to make sure that we are desiring that we together are being built up, that this temple is being built up. Here's what Mark Dever, pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church says about this very thing. He says, if you are a true follower of Christ, you will want to see the people who sit around you every Sunday built up in Christ. Building his temple today does not have to do with the fabric or furnishings of a meeting house. The true church will be built as God's truth is courageously preached, as we give ourselves to listen to it, and as we are convicted by it. This is what our congregation must not neglect. It's my God-given call and duty to preach the truth of God as found in the Word of God, as your pastor, to do that. And in the same way, if you are a follower of Christ, it is your God-given call and duty to hear the truth of God preached from the Word of God and let it convict you and change you and move you. We must not neglect either end of that. I cannot neglect preaching the word truthfully and convictionally, and you can't neglect hearing the word and letting it convict you and obeying the word. If we want to expect much, and I hope we're expecting much, I hope we're not just saying, you know, I'm good with just a little bit. I hope we're expecting much in the body of Christ because our God is a God of great blessings. But if we want to expect much and receive much, we have to be sure that we together are seeking to build up the house of God and not being so so focused on our own houses. We must do what the people who heard the word of the Lord through Haggai did, which is obey and fear the Lord. Look at verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the entire remnant of the people obeyed the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him. So the people feared the Lord. The response to the word of the Lord was that the two leading men of the people, the governor and the high priest, and all the entire remnant of the people obeyed the Lord and his words that Haggai spoke to them. Not only did they obey it, though, it wasn't just this mere duty that, okay, God told me to do it, I'll do it. It was, I'm going to obey, and I'm also going to fear the Lord. I'm going to respect the Lord. I'm going to be reverential towards the Lord. I understand who he is and who I am. They have thought carefully about their ways. They saw their error. They understood their place before their God, and it changed them. Church and Christian, think carefully about your ways. See your errors. Understand your place before your God, and let it change you. We're entering into a new year, and this is a time when we often want to set goals and resolutions, and hopefully you're better at keeping them than me. 
We want to accomplish things. We want things to change in our lives. We want to do better. And and if that's the case, then let our top goal, let your top goal or resolution or whatever you want to call it be, I want to obey and fear the Lord and I want to watch what he's going to do through it. I want to be in awe of what he can do through it, through me simply submitting humbly in obedience to the Lord and fearing him. Look what happens when people do this. Verses 13 to 15, look what happens when they are humbly obeying and fearing the Lord. Verse 13, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's message to the people, I am with you. This is the Lord's declaration. The Lord roused the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, the spirit of the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. They began work on the house of the Lord of armies, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. The people obeyed and feared the Lord, and God declared, I am with you. I am with you. Now that would be enough if he would come and just say that right there to these people, to his people. I am with you. That would be enough for us to obey and fear the Lord right there. That just the reality that he is here. He is with us. But the reality is what happened was so much more than just the presence of the Lord being with the people. It also says that he roused their spirits. God was not just overseeing their work on the temple. He didn't just say, hey, go to the mountain and do this for me. He said, go to the mountain and do this for me. I'll be with you. And I'm actually the one empowering you and rousing your spirit to do it. I'm the means of you obeying me. He was the means for their work on the temple getting done. This is so vital for us to understand because we live in America and more often than not what we hear from people that are self-help people or, you know, encouraging people on, on the internet or wherever you find that is you can do it. You are able, you are enough, you, you're good enough, just, just try harder. But that's not reality. We are called to be about the things of God. Yes, we are called to obey and fear God, but we must understand that it's not in our own strength that we're able to do it. We can't do it. We can't. We are wholly dependent on Him to do the things He has called us to do. We need Him to rouse our spirits, to empower us to obey Him. And praise God, because of what Jesus has done, He has sent His Spirit into those who believe that He is with us and He can rouse us to obey Him. We have the indwelling of His Spirit within us that empowers us to live for Him. So again, as we enter into 2024, I know we're two weeks in already, but let's think carefully about our ways. Let's think carefully about how we lived in 2023 and look at it and say, what could I have done for the Lord better? How much did I pay attention to Him and how much did I pay attention to me and my things and my interests? And repent where we need to repent and say, God, I don't want to do the same thing that I did last year in those areas that I need to change. I want to do it better and I need you to help me do it better. I need you to help me obey you. I need you to help me fear you. Rouse my spirit to be about your work in your house and not my own house. Let's set our goal and resolution to be that we are seeking to build God's house, not our own houses. And again, I don't mean the physical building of the church. I mean the body of Christ that gathers in this physical building Let us build one another up. Let us encourage one another. Let us push one another to obey the Lord, to be faithful to Him. And let's go out and bring more people in. Let's build an addition to the body of Christ. 
And if we do that, if we will humbly come before God and say, God, I know that I failed in areas last year that I should have given over to you. Help me not do the same this year. Help me to be about you and your work and your house. If we will do that together, then I am excited to see what will happen to us this year as God is with us and empowering us. Because again, if we understand who he is, the God who created everything, who sustains everything with his powerful word, if he's with us, and He's empowering us, then there is no limit to what we can do for Him this year. There's no limit what He can do through us this year. But again, we have to think about our ways, repent where we need to repent, come to the place where we obey and fear the Lord again, and be about building His house. Would you enter into this year with me in that way? hope so. Would you pray with me? God, we are beyond blessed to be able to call ourselves Christians. That we are able to call ourselves the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. God, help us to truly think carefully about our ways, not just today and this week, but but each and every day as we seek to live for you, help us to examine what we did yesterday and how we could do better in following you today and tomorrow. Help us to be about your work in your house and not worrying about putting up the panels in our house. Let us build your temple temple that meets here, that meets in houses throughout the week. God, we want to be obedient to you. We want to fear you, but we understand we need you to rouse our spirits to do it right. So God, help us rouse our spirits And let us rejoice in what we see you do in this coming year. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.